Hi, my name is Rob Garrison. I'm the CEO of Mercado Labs. Welcome to the seventh edition of First Things First, where we introduce you to thought leaders from across media, venture, and industry. Last month's guest was Mark Baxa. Mark Baxa is the president of the CSCMP, and he's also the CEO of Fernia Creek Consulting. Uh, Mark had an amazing career in supply chain, so he shared with us his long career at Monsanto, uh, talked about giving back in the industry, as well as the great work that they're doing at CSMCP. So if you didn't get a chance to check that out, I would encourage you to do so. It was a great episode. Today's guest is Dan Gardner. Dan is the founder of Trade Facilitators. And Dan's also had an amazing career in the supply chain, a little bit different way. Dan's uh, kind of done a little bit of everything. In fact, I'm going to have to read this. Uh, he's been an importer, an educator, an author, a 3PL, and more. So I know you'll enjoy hearing uh, from Dan and Dan's story today. So uh, before we get started, I'd like to congratulate Heidi Seaman for being the recipient of our episode six donation to the Let's Talk Supply Chain Diversity Pledge. And uh, once again, Ricardo will be donating $100 to this great cause on behalf of one of today's listeners. So I'd encourage you to chime in. We usually pick somebody who's uh, made a comment or asked a question. So please chime in. Okay, so now let's dive into a segment that we call uh, the Fastest Five. And be sure to stay at the end. At the end, I'm going to do a segment called uh, From Running with the Bulls to Wrestling with the Bears. And I hope you'll enjoy that as well. So after my interview with Dan, we'll dive into that. Okay, so today's hot topic in the fastest five is what's up and what's down. So I'm going to start with an article from Axios by Nathan Borney. Shout out to Nathan. Nathan reports that supply chain issues are beginning to clear up as consumer spending returns to normal. He backs up that claim with the New York Fed's Global Supply Chain Pressure Index, GSCPI, which fell for the third straight month in a row. Good news. The index is now 1.84 points above typical levels, and is down from an all-time high of 4.32 just in December. So good news to report there. Uh, another thing that's down, not in such a good way, is Black & Decker's skew and footprint, according to Sarah Zimmerman of Supply Chain Dive. Shout out to Sarah. According to her article, Black & Decker plans to slash their manufacturing footprint and their product portfolio by 40%. Uh, this is part of an urgent effort by Black & Decker to generate $1.5 billion in cost savings over the next three years. And so like many companies, the toolmaker found themselves struggling with too much inventory uh, after consumer demand dropped, ending the second quarter with $6.6 .6 billion in excess inventory. So they've got a lot to work through. So you're going to see some pretty big cost uh, slashing efforts from Black & Decker and other people who got caught with too much inventory on hand. Okay, so now let's talk about what's up. Um, surging retail inventories are swamping U.S. warehouses, according to Liz Young of the Wall Street Journal. Shout out to Liz. According to her article, Prologis, who's the world's biggest warehouse operator, said expects to add an additional 800 million square feet, or that's how much is needed of space to handle all of the excess inventories. Retailers from Walmart to Best Buy have reported a litany of reasons for the inventory glut from shrinking consumer demand to high inflation to elongated buying cycles. So one to watch there, whether we, or not we've even got enough space to handle all this excess inventory. Optimistically, retailers will get a handle on it and will have enough space, but that's certainly one to watch. Another thing that's up according to Jack Donnelly of Port Technology, shout out to Jack, is schedule reliability. So an analysis by Sea Intelligence noted that for the first time since the pandemic, the index improved year on year. So that's good news. Nine of 14 uh, carriers saw improvements in June with Evergreen reaching 40% schedule reliability, and which was a double digit improvement for them. So still nothing to write home about when you've got 40% reliability, but it's trending in the right direction. So we'll take that as a positive. Okay, and finally, according to Dominic Chaping of Market Watch, out of Dominic, Maersk saw its Q2 revenue and profits increase, get this, from $3.7 billion to $8.59 billion. Wow. Uh, revenue also surged by 57% to $17.41 billion. Uh, some quick calculations say that's almost a 50% margin. And finally, not surprisingly, freight rates rose by 64%. So there's your fastest five. And now we would like to welcome to the show the great Dan Gardner. Dan, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, Rob. It's a pleasure, Dan. I've known Dan for years, and Dan is one of the best of the best, so I'm delighted to have him on the show. 
Um, Dan, if you wouldn't mind, can you start by sharing your background with our listeners? And if you could kind of take us back to the beginning, you've had a really interesting career, as I mentioned at the top of my segment, uh, you've kind of done it all. So if you could take us back to the beginning and also what you're up to these days. Sure. I'll, I'll try to give you the reader's digest version, because as we said in the green room, it's a, a 30 minute broadcast. So we need to, <laughs> to give a, a, a high level. But uh, greetings, everybody. Thanks again, Rob, for having me. It's flattering to be on your show. Um, I'm, I'm actually broadcasting, tuning in from right next to the L.A. Long Beach Port Complex, uh, but come from from Massachusetts. I'm from Lynn, Massachusetts, started in my career in freight forwarding and customs brokerage at my home port of Boston. But the journey from Boston to Los Angeles was was not a, a direct one. There was some circumvention <laughs> of the globe uh, that, that went on along the way. So I do come from a customs brokerage and freight forwarding background, worked for Fritz companies back in the day, a, a, a truly legendary organization, DHL no Global Forwarding, XL Global Logistics. But the big thing for me, and this this is kind of a segue into the supply chain portion of my career, the, the best thing for me, and you appreciate this, we've talked about this before, Rob, is that you get exposure to all types of different industries, importers, exporters, footwear people, medical equipment people. And if you really take the time to listen and go see the factories and see the, the vendors and see the op the ports and what have you, it is the best live classroom that there is for a broad exposure, not only to logistics, but trade compliance supply chain as well. So that's what really fast forwarding to 2007, uh, started this company called Trade Facilitators, which was based built off a network that I that I built over the years in the 3PL space, in the customer space as well. And we do three things: basically BCO consulting. Uh, we we work with supply chain technology companies uh, as well as in the trade compliance space. Uh, and we have an educational component as well, uh, producing classes, certifications, degree programs for institutions like Cal State Long Beach. I actually taught last night uh, for Cal State Long Beach. So that, that's kind of been the trajectory along the way. I did become a, an adjunct professor, a great source of learning <laughs> as well, and wrote, wrote a couple books, and here we are. Hey, Dan, he, he, Dan's being humble. When he said he wrote a couple, I believe it's six, if I'm not mistaken. But Dan, before you answer... I just want to let everybody know we've got uh, Sarah Essam listening all the way from Egypt. I saw uh, we've that. also got John Tucker listening from South Africa and Paul Dunn from Ireland. So we've got a truly global crew today. So thank you and welcome all from uh, from abroad. OK, Dan, so you were saying you wrote a couple of books and I think by my count, it was six, if I'm not mistaken. So is that right? Yeah, f five. But uh, oh, five. I'll, OK, I'll, maybe we can do the sixth one together. <laughs> <laughs> I would love to do that. Co-author. So you do consulting. You skipped a couple of points along your journey. You, you talked about uh, really kind of learning the business by being in the business. And mm -hmm. one of the things that I recall about your journey is you got to spend some time abroad. Tell us a little bit about that. I did. I spent 13 years in Latin America, had, had some experience as a youngster, uh, as an exchange student in Latin America, uh, really interested in Spanish and, and what have you. So as a young executive working for Fritz Companies in Boston, I was transferred to Bogota, Colombia, to be the head fire putter outer on the ground. <laughs> uh, spent a year there. I uh, was in Miami for quite some time and then was transferred right after 9-11, tragically, to uh, Guadalajara, Mexico, uh, where I was then working for XL Global Logistics. So I was president of Latin America from, from Guad and got a real education on the supply chain side because we were dealing with a lot of contract manufacturers, uh, Flextronics, what was then Sanmina SCI, Celestica, uh, HP as a, as a device manufacturer. And, and what I found was that where I knew a little bit about logistics and air freight and ocean freight and all that stuff, we, we'd go to meetings with these customers and they'd be using terminology that I just didn't understand. So I, I decided, and I saw one of your people tuning in has a certification in production and inventory management through Apex. Uh, I actually did that while I was abroad. It was a, I guess you'd call it a correspondence course back then. <laughs> and literally, you know, I took the test online, but that was about it. But that, that experience, and I would encourage anybody in the supply chain space to always be curious, always continue to be, to be learning because the experience I had getting that certification and understanding materials requirements planning and forecasting and sales and operations planning and, and how logistics fits into that, I think 
that made me a more effective executive. So yeah, spent some time in Latin America. I had the good fortune uh, at like yourself, Rob, um, been to Asia, lost count, you know, on the whole China trip thing from Beijing to Shenzhen and back again. And it's, it's that curiosity that, that go and see for yourself mentality that really counts in this business. So Dan, you're, you've gone from learning to teaching. Uh, that's mm -hmm. a nice trajectory in your career. Tell us a little bit about what you teach. Who are your students and what are you teaching them? Yeah. Well, I started actually when I was in Boston teaching the GED. Uh, and I'm talking, I hate to date myself. I was a young man, but it was oh, 85, 86 teaching the GED, the high school equivalency to what were then in East Boston or Eastie, as we like to call it, <laughs> to, to essentially uh, refugees from the genocide of, of Cambodia, Pol Pot. Wow as well as the, the upheavals and revolutions going on in, in Central America, Honduras, Guatemala, El Salvador especially. So I had an interest in education from the get-go. And then in the forwarding space, I just got invited to, to speak at a couple, what were then seminars when we used to go to a hotel <laughs> and have a seminar um, on different subjects, letters of credit, import regs, things of this nature. Um, and then transition to a university environment, University of Miami, Florida International University when I lived in in South Florida, but currently I'm on the I'm on the faculty at Georgia Tech, their Supply Chain and Logistics Institute, Cal State Long Beach, I mentioned, as well as Long Beach City College. And, and what I found out was that if you want to be a good teacher, you'd better be a better student because I was always dealing with, you know, adults, adult, adult continuing education from MBA programs to certification programs, et cetera. And what I quickly learned is that the first day of class, these students are going to test you. And if they think you're a goof from, from day one and you don't know what you're talking about, you've lost the group. So by the time you get to class, that should be the easy part. The hard part is in the preparation, which in turn prepares you better. It becomes this virtuous cycle, at least in, in my humble instance, it becomes this virtuous cycle where you're learning on the job, you're in the field, you're doing all of those things but also preparing for class so you can keep the audience and it makes sure hopefully that they, they, they think they're going to get a good exchange because the professor actually knows what they're talking about. So that, that's really forced me. You want to be a good teacher, be a better student. And that's helped me a lot. Dan, that's a great story. And I didn't know that part about um, when you were in Easty teaching GED. So uh, thanks for sharing that with me as well. By and so uh, one, one last uh stop I'd like to make along your journey is you went from being, you know, sort of a, a 3PL to a teacher to an author, and then you became a practitioner. Uh, you became an importer, what you referred to as a BCO, which for those of you who don't know, that means beneficial cargo owner, Right. Uh, also called an importer, also called a customer. And tell us about that experience for a little bit. Um, it, whatever you can divulge about what you did there would be oh, great absolutely. for the audience. Yeah. Yeah, well, it was really a fortuitous experience for me from a timing perspective because I had dealt with BCOs, those beneficial cargo owners, my whole career and felt that I had a, a decent feel for their perspective and what motivated them internally and what what their how they worked with freight forwarders and customs brokers, et cetera. But but that experience of a medium sized let, let's yeah, medium sized importer, uh, school supplies and school furniture. I say fortuitous timing wise, because the organization at that time, we're going back four or five years ago now, was going from a one warehouse distribution network for the United States that was here in Carson, California, to standing up a 750,000 square foot facility in Kentucky, which, of course, in any supply chain is going to find it's going to resonate uh, across the entire supply chain all the way to relationships with vendors and got them into things that they had never heard of before transload, intermodal, the rail piece, you know, two twin drive, you know, twin driver, double driver, hot shots, the whole thing. So to be a part of the team that set that up from scratch, along with the underlying technology that enabled it, selfishly uh, was a was a great experience, not only from that operational perspective, but truly understanding the dynamic, for example, between sourcing, purchasing, logistics, who the internal customer really is at a BCO, and what it, what what motivates people to behave in, in certain ways. And it, it really was a, a great experience. That'll be a, a good tee up to our next topic in just a minute, which is SNOP. But 
Let me ask you just one quick question. Was it surprising when you got on the importer side? I mean, you, you probably had all these expectations as a vendor to those customers, what things would be like. Any surprises uh, on being on the inside, being actually working for an importer versus servicing one? Yeah, um, that's one of the things I like about this industry. There's always surprises about everything that, that, <laughs> that you do. But so, yeah, there were definitely surprises, just the complexity of the purchasing function when you're dealing with 30, 40,000, which isn't a lot in the grand scheme of things, but 30, 40,000 SKUs and doing a couple of hundred new product introductions a year. And what does that mean logistically, starting with a forecast and, and all of those things? Um, with that said, much of my experience was a validation of things that, that I had experienced with customers on the 3PL side, but not, it was obviously on the different different side of the table. So it was uh, some surprises that were really helpful, uh, as well as validations of, of things that I, I had suspected and um, some things that I was completely wrong about. <laughs> it's the other part of supply chain. If you think you're going to be right every time, it's time to go to barber college because you're not going to last. <laughs> so, Dan, I just a quick comment that uh, even though you're sitting in Los Angeles now, you have not lost a lot of the Eastie, as you call it, accent. So that's a good thing. <laughs> yeah, well, don't get me started on that because I've, I've tried. And, of course, I grew up 10 miles from the garden, Boston Garden. And uh, during my time in Massachusetts, it was Larry Bird and Magic and that whole thing. So I, I don't really talk much socially here in SoCal because I just don't feel like <laughs> listening to it, you know, about the accent. And people think I'm reticent. You know, I can get I'd rather talk on a webcast than to somebody directly at a Starbucks. Because they just end up antagonizing me. Got it. So before we transition to a couple other questions I've got for you, um, is there any advice you'd give to somebody, you know, based on your journey and the fact that you're a teacher and you deal with lots of young people? Is there any advice that you'd give to somebody who's young and just starting out in the supply chain industry? Uh, any any thoughts on that? What would you what, what kind of guidance would you give to someone starting out today? Yeah, I, I think uh, everybody's journey is different, uh, but I'd start out with the the underlying philosophy of. Uh, stay curious, be, always be willing to learn, but always you have to be willing to do the work too. Uh, you know, I deal with a lot of younger people, my, my own kids, and <laughs> they, they, they need to, to get, you have to put in the work too. Um, you want to be able to learn, obviously, but you have to create value. You have to find ways to create value. And that's really quite important. That curiosity component should really translate into a a lifelong commitment to continuing education. You don't have to go to a four-year school. You don't even have to get a two-year degree. You can go on Coursera. You can go on LinkedIn. You can go on YouTube. Uh, you, you, I know people uh, that, that we've counseled at Cal State Long Beach that took a certification program in, in logistics at Cal State Long Beach and then we, we coach them into getting their broker's license, customs broker's license, um, which I am one as well. So I'm, I'm biased to that to that length. But just put together a combination of skills over time that create more value because global trade, whether it's on a country level, an industry level, a company level, or most importantly, an individual level, you have to be able to compete. And in our business, it's about the, the acquisition and application of acquired knowledge. That means there's no such thing as a born supply chain person. There's no such thing as a born customs broker. You have to go out, put in the work, gain the experience, work on your game in your in your spare time, and 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 stay competitive. That Great would be advice. Fun. Great advice. Yeah, and Dan's got three kids, so he knows from experience, knows from what he talks. Mm -hmm. um, so I want to switch gears if we could. So that you know, as we talked about, supply chain's been extremely chaotic i would argue for the last five years but particularly in the last two since the since the uh, pandemic and I, I wonder if you have any thoughts on what's the role of a supplier in the supply chain we talk a lot about all the domestic challenges we have with getting capacity and getting on the rail and so forth what do you think about suppliers in the supply chain what's their role and how important is their role in this whole process yeah i, I think the answer to that question geez let me I think it starts with a, a true understanding of what supply chain is. And I'll, I'll, it took me 30 years to figure this out, but I'll give it to you in 10 <laughs> seconds. So when you think about it, it's, supply chain is about predicting the future and placing bets. What do I mean by that? Predicting the future with a forecast of sales, be they existing evergreen products or, or new product introductions, and then placing your bets in the form of a budget. 
how much merchandise, assuming that you're, you're an importer, let's use the Trans-Pacific Eastbound as, a, as an example, an importer, you have to convert that forecast for existing and new products into purchase orders that are then placed over time in specific quantities on the vendor. So the, the vendor, of course, quality product at a reasonable price, that, that's the price of admission into the game. But they are such a vital player in all these other aspects. So to answer your question, the role of the supplier, in addition to manufacturing goods on behalf of a buyer, is origin, collaboration, and coordination. Simple stuff that you might not think about. The relationship that an origin vendor has with their freight forwarder or the freight forwarder of the BCO in the United States, depending on what the Ecoterms rule is. Simple things. Who, who's going to make a booking for a container? How reliable is that booking going to be? So treat, to answer the question, treat your supplier as a partner, obviously, from a product perspective, but understand that their, their actions are, are going to permeate, go up and down the supply chain from start to finish, uh, starting with that purchase order that's placed on a vendor overseas and the many travails that can go on from that moment forward. Yeah, thanks. That's great. And uh, that sort of leads into the next question I had for you. You introduced me a while ago to the term S and O P. Would you mind defining that term for the audience? We've got about four minutes left Defining the term for that audience and uh, for our audience. Sorry. And then also explaining what the importance of an S and O P is. I, I don't think like me, I think a lot of people weren't familiar with the whole notion of how do we tie all these crazy things together in a supply chain? And S and O P seems like a logical place to start, yeah? Yeah, sales and operations planning, just, just fascinating to me and, and fairly common sense. But my experience has been that the the more common sense something is in the supply chain, the harder it is to do. <laughs> There's an inverse relationship there. But sales and operations planning uh, goes back to this idea that virtually all importers are going to start with a forecast of every item that they sell over the course of a year. They're going to convert th that forecast into POs, as we said a moment ago, and then the, the game is afoot, as they say. Sales and operations planning recognizes that, but companies put together, this is really important, a multifunctional team of representatives from purchasing, from sales, from logistics, from trade compliance, everybody that needs a window into what's going on in the inbound supply chain. And really what they do is they start out with the forecast but then the year starts to unfold. Some products start selling well, others are on forecast, others are not selling so well. So what SNOP does on, at a minimum on a monthly basis is to get this multifunctional team together and look at the forecast by, pro, by product family, by category, you know, wearing apparel versus accessories versus footwear for a fashion company. And they make specific observations. Product A is kicking butt. Do we need to order more? Will we get it in time? You know, that whole bullwhip effect thing, whereas if a cut, if a product isn't selling so well, do they back off of a PO? What's the what's the last change date on a purchase order? Can they change the quantity? What's the last ship date? So in the end, SNOP is taking actual results compared with forecasted results. There's always going to be a difference and making adjustments up or down, depending on what you discover in, in that ongoing process of sales and operations planning. Yeah, it seems like that every company should do that, Dan. So what do you what do you find in terms of real world? Are a lot of people using that approach? Yeah, um, well, kind of. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think people are more in tune to it because of the pandemic and disruptions and this bullwhip effect that, you know, people over ordered. You mentioned Black & Decker. Target has publicly stated they've overreached, what have you. I think larger organizations that have more resources and more robust ERPs are, are more likely to do that. But in the smaller organizations where, where people wear multiple hats, it might even be easier if you think about it. Because I'm, if I'm the logistics person and I'm in charge of purchasing for a small to medium sized importer, I'm the same person. So, so yeah, the communication of the string. Yeah, absolutely. So I, I think more and more companies are doing that. I think software is starting to catch up in terms of the requirements for that capability, because after a while, you know, the whole spreadsheet thing isn't going to cut it. But uh, certainly become um, people have become more in tune to that as a result of all the goings on in the last couple of years. OK, so, Dan, we, I, I'm going to let you go on this note. We've got a question from uh, Mohammed, and he asks if you have any contracting tips. 
Um, well, if Mohammed can elaborate a bit on if it, is it contracting with vendors or contracting with three PLs, or we can just take it in general. But what I will tell people, and, and let's let's talk about the contracting with vendors as an example. And, and I get a big, big kick out of things like near shoring and reshoring and what have you, because Rob, given your experience, you know this as well. It takes a good two, three years to have a solid relationship with a vendor. So th this notion, and I've seen it a million times in our consulting business, have, have worked in it, on it, that companies are going to, well, we're going to stop sourcing in China because of the 301 tariffs and it's expensive anyway. And we're going to start sourcing in, in Vietnam or Mexico. Good luck with that. <laughs> because it, first of all, depending on the product that you're importing, it might not be even produced in Vietnam or Mexico. They might not have the tier one, tier two, tier three raw material suppliers in those countries. So let, let's not get out over our skis on the, the near shoring, reshoring story, because it takes time to develop trust based, operationally oriented, customer focused relationships. I think there's a future for it, but based on my own experience and working with clients that want to move from somewhere else into Mexico, look before you leap uh, because there might not even be a cliff to jump off of. <laughs> well, and uh, Mohammed did clarify that we're talking about general contracting terms, but we're out of time. So let me do this, Dan, if I could. Can you? Would you mind sharing with this audience uh, your contact information? So if they've got additional questions or they'd like to consult with you on a project that they've got or just yeah, 100 percent. Uh, should i put my email in the chat or just say what my email is uh if you could do both that'd be great or yeah. I, actually kaylee if you don't mind putting that in the chat for dan i'd appreciate it and um dan if you can just say it yeah so it's uh b as in dan gardner g-a-r-d-n-e-r -E at trade t as in tom r a d e f as in frank a c i l dot com so it's d gardner at tradefacil.com and everybody know well Spanish speakers know that facile in Spanish means easy. So <laughs> trade facile, baby. <laughs> Make trade easy with Dan Gardner. <laughs> right on. Dan, it's been a pleasure having you. I wish we had uh, another hour or so because you've got a fascinating background and we just scratched the surface. But anytime. Appreciate it. I really it. appreciated it. And I'm sure the audience did as well. So thank you very much. If anybody needs a, a great resource for just about anything related to the supply chain, Dan's your guy. Uh, please reach out to him. Thanks for having okay. me. Dan, thank you very much. Have a great day. Thank you. Okay, so I'm going to end this segment I'm just talking for a couple minutes about a transition that I see occurring in the supply chain. And uh, I call it bulls and bears. And for those who don't know that what, what I mean by bulls and bears, it's a Wall Street term. And so Wall Street talks about when things are going good and stocks are going up and money's flowing well and the economy's doing good, they call it a bull market, meaning it's going up. Everything is going well and progressing this way. They call it a bull market. Conversely, when stocks are going down and, and economic times are hard, you have what's called a bear market. And so bulls and bears are just two terminologies that are common in finance and common in Wall Street. So I use those sometimes to describe what's happening in supply chains. And so by any measure, the last two years have been a bull market in the supply chain. Capacity was maxed out, freight rates increased, sales and consumer goods went through the roof, and many companies made record profits. And so by any measure, it's been a bull market for the last two years. And for supply chain professionals, specifically us, that made for a really wild ride. We were constantly trying to keep up the pace and secure the resources necessary to get products to market. And so all the old rules sort of went out the window as price became an afterthought and capacity became king. So now it appears that instead of a uh, running with the bull scenario, supply chain professionals will instead be wrestling with the bears or how do you wrestle with the down market? And so when you look at some of the bear indicators, inflation's at its highest level in 40 years. We've had two quarters in a row of GDP decline, a lack of additional stimulus funding. So that means likely that cost is once again king, not capacity, but cost. So retailers will begin to slash prices to deal with a glut of inventory. Consumers will continue to cut back on spending due to higher expenses. And, you know, everything from food to rent is going up. So for supply chain professionals, this means that attention will turn from get it here any way you can, which has been the mantra the last two years, to get it here at the lowest possible cost. So this is going to require supply chain professionals to once again look for gains in efficiency, possibly fewer partners and doing more with less. And that's the traditional role of supply chain. So that, that won't surprise anybody too much. But last couple of years, it's been crazy the other way. Throw cost out the window, just get the product here. 
we're about to return to a normal situation in supply chain where our job is to get products to market as efficiently and quickly as possible, but emphasis on the on the efficiency. So no one said a career in supply chain would be easy, but if you uh, but the challenge you crave, you are in the right industry. Thank you all very much for your time. Uh, great conversation with Dan Gardner, and uh, we look forward to catching up with you next month for another episode of First Things First. Take care. Bye-bye.